We're glad you're here this morning, and uh, we want to just look at God's Word today from Ephesians chapter 3 as we uh, look again at the subject of prayer. Uh, I have to tell this because uh, uh, when uh, Aust Brown was praying his opening prayer, um, he was talking about the yin and the yang, and uh, he did not know it, but Ying Yang is sitting down front here. <laughs> and she wondered why Aust was praying about her. <laughs> so Ying, no offense made by that. But I thought that was great. Today we're talking about prayer with a purpose. If you look at Ephesians chapter 3, we'll read what uh, Paul has to say uh, about this important uh, subject. He says, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner man, inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul uh, prays this prayer with a purpose and it's a model for us as we begin to uh, look at this passage this morning. Uh, many of you know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was. He was a uh, German pastor and theologian uh, who took a stand against Hitler and was imprisoned and, and later executed for his defiance of Hitler and his regime. But uh, he also was a, a well-known uh, pastor and he wrote a lot of books and had a great influence in uh, the religious life of the German people and uh, also others around the world. Uh, he contended that everyone needs to learn how to pray. And he wrote in his book, Psalms, the prayer book of the Bible, that prayer does not simply mean to pour out your heart, one's heart. It means rather to find the way to God and speak with him, whether the heart is full or empty. And that's important because sometimes we don't pray because we don't feel like it, do we? Sometimes we don't pray because uh, we don't feel like uh, God is uh, real close to us at the moment. But Bonhoeffer's point is this, no matter how you feel, you need to pray. And so it is important for us to learn how to pray. We need to find a practical way to pray, a way that could, can help us no matter how we feel at the moment. And Paul has given a personal prayer for the Ephesians we looked at earlier in chapter 1. But here in Ephesians 3, Paul offers a prayer with a purpose that all of us can use. He reminds the believers that he has been given the job of preaching the mystery, that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And so he feels a great uh, responsibility to lead these Gentiles into this discovery of prayer and how they can come closer to God through prayer. So in great gratitude and humility, Paul boldly and confidently prays for these believers. <coughs> now we didn't read it, but back there in verse 12, uh, notice it says, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul is talking here about having boldness and access through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So before we even think about prayer, we need to understand that as a child of God, we have the opportunity to pray. We have the right to pray. We have uh, permission to pray. Stories told about uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, members of his cabinet, cabinet would be very aggravated because right in the middle of the cabinet meeting, 
his son would barge in and talk to the president and show him something he was excited about. And the cabinet members were always disgruntled, but Abe Lincoln always stopped what he was doing, looked at his son, and took time to speak with him, and then ushered him on out. Now, his son had boldness to come into the president's office and talk with him no matter who else was around. And that's a picture of you and me. We have boldness and we have the opportunity and we have the access to Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. So don't feel like you don't have the right to come to God. You do. Some people have said many times, and I've heard them say it publicly, I don't want to bother God with some little detail like that. Hey, if my kid's hurting, if my kid has a question, if my kid's troubled about something, I want him to bother me. And so whatever it is on your heart and mind, you as a child of God can come boldly and have access to Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, notice that this gives you great confidence and authority when you do that. He says, we may approach God with freedom and confidence there in verse 12. And how can we do that? How can we have freedom and confidence? Well, one, because we're a child of God, but also we can pray according to Scripture. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it tells us that whatever we ask of Him, if it's in accordance with His will, He'll give us what we ask of Him. How do you know if it's in accordance with His will? Well, you go back to the Word of God. And whatever He tells us to do, whatever He shares with us, whatever promises He gives to us, you take those back to God and say, Oh, Lord, you said don't worry about anything, but, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I'm really worried right now, Lord. I'm afraid I'm going to get laid off from my job. And I'm coming boldly before you saying, Help! God hears a prayer like that because you're study, you've studied his word and you're claiming your prayer on the basis of his word. You can come with confidence. You can come with freedom and you have authority when you pray. And so Paul begins his prayer there in verse 14. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. And so here he comes before God to pray. And he kneels. He kneels before God to show his submission, to show his willingness to bow before God. And you know, it's not so much important as to the position you take. Paul took the position of kneeling here. My knees are pretty bad now. I don't kneel too much anymore because it hurts. But uh, I do sometimes get on my face before the Lord. And sometimes I sit in a chair before the Lord. And sometimes I walk around the room and pray. And all those are okay. You know why? Because the most important thing is not the position you take physically. It's the position you take in your heart. When you humble yourself and kneel before the Lord in your heart. And so Paul kneels before the Father. The Father who is the Father of all of us. And he prays. And so here he begins this purposeful prayer. What is it? Well, pur purposeful prayer for others includes first the Request for inner power. The request for inner power. Notice he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So here's a request for inner power. If, if you're going to pray for yourself, you're going to pray for someone else, pray that they receive inner power. Now, it's interesting to me, and I've observed this over the years as a pastor and as a Christian, uh, the most spiritual people don't know it. The people who are closest to the Lord really don't realize it. Uh, it's because they are always constantly seeking to be closer to God, and they never feel like they reach that point. And so their walk is humble, their walk is devoted, their walk is, is uh, one of uh, great love and respect for God, and yet they're always feeling like somehow they don't, haven't fully reached it, and they want to bow and pray some more and receive all that God has for them. And so Paul is saying, look, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. 
that a person might be mighty in spirit. And, and when he talks about this inner being, it's the inmost part of a person's life, their spiritual life, their intellectual life. It, it's what makes up them as they think and process and are conscious and use their will and as they reflect on God and as God's spirit speaks to them. Paul says, I pray that you'll be strengthened with power right there, right there on the inside, and, and that when you are, your influence will become greater, that you'll be marked by an influence out in the outside world. You see, anything that happens outside usually is a result of what's already taken place in the inside. And so you want to be a person who is kind and gentle. That takes place in the struggle on the inside where you get rid of your bitterness and you confess your sins to God and, and you ask him for forgiveness and then uh, pray that he'll give you grace to be kind and gentle with others the same way he's kind and gentle with you. And suddenly your outer life begins to change because your inner life is being changed by the Spirit of God. You, you see, these things don't happen by accident. It happens by people who kneel before the Father and spend time with him and ask the Lord to change them. You say you want to be a better mother? Then, then maybe you need to get on your knees before God and you need to say, Lord, show me the areas of my life that are causing my child to act that way. Show me the areas of my life that are causing disruptions in my marriage. Show me the areas of my life that I need to change, that I need to work on. And then, Lord, as you make those changes, work it out in my family. Work it out with my kids. Work it out with my spouse. And suddenly what happens on the outside is because of what's happened already on the inside. You get what I mean? That's what Paul is talking about, that God will give you his riches to strengthen you with power through his spirit on the inside, in the inner being. And he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It's a picture of Jesus just walking in your home and taking over. And you're not just giving him a closet. You're not just giving him the study. You're not just giving him a bedroom. You're giving him the keys to the whole house. That's what Paul is talking about. You know, one scholar has said, uh, for some people, Christ is just present. For other people, Christ is prominent. But for some people, Christ is preeminent. Preeminent. He has the whole house. It's all his. He is in control. The idea here is that he would dwell in your hearts. It would be a settled residence, a place where he lives and moves and has his being in our lives. I love the poem, uh, If Jesus Came to Your House to Spend a Day or Two. My brother and uh, his friend Bob, uh, when they were uh, singing together, they made a song out of this, and I, I'm sure you've heard other um, songs related to this as well. But the poem goes like this. If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. Well, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the food you'd serve to him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him there, and that serving him in your own home is joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, uh, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched and welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they'd been? Would you turn off the radio and hope he hadn't heard and wish you hadn't uttered that last loud hasty word? Would you hide your worldly music and put some hymn books out? Would you let Jesus write in, or would you rush about? And I wonder if the Savior spent a day or two with you. Would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say? Would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family conversation keep up its usual pace? Or would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read? And let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed. 
Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you plan to go? Or would you maybe change your plans just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your closest friends? Or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus Christ in person came to spend some time with you. Paul prays that Christ would dwell in us, not just a day or two, every day. That he would be completely in charge of everything about us. So we pray for inner power. We pray that God's spirit would fill us to the fullness and Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. Well, then notice also he says <clears throat> that purposeful prayer for others includes a request for a firm grasp of love. Firm grasp of love. And uh, it's interesting how he says this. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. <coughs> so he's talking about all the dimensions. He, he wants you to know everything there is to know about Christ and his love. And so he says, you, you have to have a firm grasp of love. You have to have that inner power, yes, but also a firm grasp of love. Um, one person has said that every life has some kind of roots and foundation. The distinctive thing about the Christian life is that it is rooted and grounded in love. Have you thought about that before? Paul uses two analogies here. One is roots, just like a plant puts its roots down into the soil and grows. Everybody does that. All of us are putting our roots down into something. Jesus says some of that soil is rocky, some of that soil is shallow, some of that soil has uh, thorns and thistles in it and chokes out the plant. But some of the soil is good and rich and full of nutrients. And so the plant will grow as it plants itself in that good soil. So what, what is the soil of your life? What are you rooting yourself in? Some people root it in a lot of different things. But the Christian is to root themselves in Christ so they will grow full and rich in who he is. The other analogy is the idea of a foundation where uh, the life is built on love. The foundation is laid. It's Jesus Christ. He is the, he, he is the foundation of love, and we build our lives on him, and our lives are lived in love. It, it's a uh, wonderful picture, the idea of grasping that. It, it, the idea that it becomes yours. It, it's your experience, your possession. And so Paul says, pray that you can grasp that kind of love. It, it's not beyond our reach, but grasp for it. Ask God to give it to you. Ask God to fulfill your life with love in the innermost being. <clears throat> William Plow uh, had a sermon comparing this verse with John 3.16. It goes something like this. He says, uh, pray <clears throat> for how wide is the love of God. And so he says, God so loved the world. That's how wide his love is. Pray for how long is his love. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He went to great lengths to give his only son. And then pray for how deep is the love of God. He God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him. So the depth goes into belief and faith in Christ. And then pray for how high is the love of God. Whoever believes in him will have, not perish, but have everlasting life. The great height. How wide, how long, how deep, how high. All the dimensions of Christ's love. We're to pray that God gives that to us. So our whole life exudes love. Our whole life exudes love. When, when somebody touches you, what comes out? When you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? Okay. When someone squeezes you, what comes out? 
As a Christian, it should be love. It should be love. That's what Paul is praying here, that we have a firm grasp of the love of God. Well, then he goes on. He says, we also have purposeful, purposeful prayer for others that includes the request for the fullness of God. And this just kind of summarizes it all up. Request for the fullness of God. He says, I pray that you know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now think about that. Is that possible? Is that possible? It's it's pretty a powerful idea, isn't it? Paul says, I pray that you know this love. It's a spiritual perception and understanding that only God can give to us, that we begin to discern who he is and what he is and how much he loves us and cares for us. David Crowder has a song that, that, that goes, uh, Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And when Crowder sings that song, I just get goosebumps because you know that Crowder understands what he's singing about. And I want to know that love of God too. I want to know the Lord intimately like that. To know how much he loves me. How much he cares for me. Some of us have a wrong perception of God. And Paul, uh, Paul is praying here that we begin to understand that we have the right perception of God. A spiritual perception that knows the love of God that passes all knowledge. This is the kind of love we're to pray for. That we might be filled. That means that we might expand ourselves to the point where we're completely filled. It's the idea of, of getting bigger and bigger and bigger, expanding, expanding, expanding. And, and the idea is someone says, I want to give something to you. And you come with a, a little thimble and they say, no, no, no. Uh, you got to get something larger than that. So you go back and you, you get a cup, and they say, no, 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 you have to get something larger than that. And so you go back and you get a bucket, and they say, no, 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 you have to get larger than that. And so you go out and you get a big old round uh, uh, stainless steel tub, and they say, no, it has to be bigger than that. And you're going, what are they going to give to me? Well, that's the idea Paul's saying here. Just keep praying that you'll expand. Keep on expanding so you can receive all the fullness of who God is and what he wants to give us, all the fullness of his love that he has for us. Uh, Vaughn says, it's like the teacup on the seashore filled to overflowing with the swelling water of the vast ocean. God's ocean of love is vast and mighty. And we're just like a little teacup, just getting a little bit of it. Paul says, keep on praying that your bucket gets bigger and you receive more and more and more of the fullness of God. And so here we have a request for inner power, a request for a firm grasp of love, a request for the fullness of God. And Paul is just so overwhelmed thinking about God and his love. Here's what he says in his closing. He's more or less just saying, hey, I'm not crazy when I'm talking about all this. The closing is this, purposeful prayer is not an illusion. It's not an illusion. It's something that God wants us to do on a daily basis, a moment-by-moment -moment basis, so we can experience Him and His power and His love and all of His fullness. We're to constantly keep praying that, Paul says. And so he closes out with this overwhelming doxology in verses 20 and 21. He says, Now to Him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in, in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And you can just almost hear Paul uh, shouting when he says those words. God is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine. Why is it we don't ask him for big things? Why don't we dream big and ask for big things? We're worried about meeting a budget. Why don't we ask God to help us meet the budget? Why, why don't we ask God to give us so much income 
that we have more than we know what to do with so this world around us can be doubly blessed. That's a big thing, isn't it? Why don't we pray that? Could it be that we don't believe it? Could it be that we don't think that God's able to do that? Paul says he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. And so we need to do that. Pray big. Think big. Ask God to move in a mighty way. Well, I love the story about uh, Mr. Yates uh, who lived down in Texas and uh, he was in the Great Depression and he owned this huge piece of land down there and he raised sheep, but, uh, you know, times were tough. He had come to the point of bankruptcy. He might lose his ranch and uh, an oil company came by and said, hey, uh, there might be oil under your land. Do we? Can you just give us the rights to drill for oil down here? And so Mr. Yates said, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to lose the ranch anyway if, if you don't do something soon. So at a shallow depth, the workmen hit what at that time was the largest oil deposit found on the North American continent. Overnight, Mr. Yates became a billionaire. The amazing thing is that those riches were there all that time, and he didn't even know it. He didn't even know it. You see, a lot of us are like Mr. Yates. We have this vast ocean of God's love. We have this amazing deposit of his riches, and we don't even realize it. We're not tapping into it. Paul says, get on your knees and pray and ask God to give you his power, give you his love, give you his fullness. And that's what we should be praying for each other and for ourselves during these 40 days of Lent as we prepare for Easter. Pray that God's people will know the inner power of Christ, God's love and the fullness of God. Can you keep on praying that? We asked you a while back to... uh, Pray specific prayers for Parkview during the season of Lent. I hope during your quiet time you're doing that and you're praying these prayers, asking God to move. You see, I, I have a disconnect. And the disconnect's this. We ask people to pray, and then they put things like this on the shelf as if it doesn't matter. Oh, it matters so much that our finances increase, that attendance increase that our church develop a capital campaign, that we have future vision for Parkview, and that many come to know Christ this Easter season. Those are big things. We need to pray that the God who's big will answer our prayers and show us his miracles in these days ahead. Are you praying, people? Are you asking God to move in a mighty way? Let's do it. Father, as we humbly bow this morning, Our prayer is that we will think big. Lord, that you will strengthen us in the inner being. And Lord, that um, you will begin to uh, let us understand and fully perceive the love of Christ. How deep and wide and and Lord, how, how long and how massive and expansive is this love of Christ that passes knowledge, Lord. We just pray that you will fill us with your fullness. Our cups are small, but Lord, you have a mighty ocean of love, a mighty ocean of power, a mighty ocean of riches. And so, Lord, help us to expand our vessels that we might receive more and more of your power, love, and sound mind. Lord, move in our church. Do great things as we prepare for this Easter season. And help us to look beyond ourselves and begin to see the world around us in its great need and its great lack of knowledge of who Jesus is. Help us, Father, to share the gospel in these wicked days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have our hymn of invitation at this time and pray that God's Spirit is speaking to you. Some of you may want to come here and pray at the front and Others may come for other reasons. Whatever it is, God's speaking to you this morning. Let's all stand together. You come as we sing.